Hey everyone, let's talk about portfolio management. So one thing that you can do to get a sense of a prospective allocation is to use factor analysis. Uh, remember the best way to consider a new allocation is of course to use mean variance optimization, but for some uh, assets which might have had recent losses with high volatility, uh, low recent returns, a mean variance optimizer might not give you a reasonable allocation. So how else can you think about how this uh, new position that you're considering might affect your current portfolio? Well, looking at risk factor exposures can give you a sense of whether if you do add this new allocation, uh, what additional types of risks might this expose you to, or which of your current exposures uh, this might magnify or reduce. So to begin with, let's actually look at the factor exposures of our current portfolio. So let's uh, consider a situation where we've got the five uh, FANG stocks, uh, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Netflix. And we're considering adding a new position in Tesla, but if for some reason mean variance optimization doesn't work for us, uh, let's see how this would affect our factor loadings. So first let's look at the factor loadings of our portfolio as it is before we add Tesla. Uh, so let's go to analyze to open it up in the port suite. And now if we go to tracking error and volatility, and there to factors, we will then actually see which risk factors drive the returns to our portfolio as it currently stands. So first of all, you can see that here are the non-zero exposures in sort of descending order of impact uh, for our portfolio. The way that we actually measure how much of our returns are driven by any particular risk factor is using this contribution column, where you can see that that's calculated as the portfolio's exposure to each factor uh, times sort of a marginal effect. You can think of that as sort of like a linear approximation uh, derivative right around its current level. Um, relative to the total amount of risk in the portfolio. So you can see that about 52% of the total risk in our portfolio as it is, is driven by the market. And interestingly, you can actually see that our exposure to the market factor is just about one. Um, but if you think about what, port what stocks we actually have in the portfolio, uh, some, of the some of the biggest uh, and most sort of uh, high performing ones in recent history. Uh, those of course are the ones that have driven a lot of market performance, particularly Apple. Um, but all of them really have a very strong correlation with the market just because of the large fraction of the market that they represent. So this just about uh, one for one exposure to the market shouldn't surprise us too much. Um, after that, we see we have a reasonably high, though much lower, uh, contribution to the total portfolio risk from a technology uh, factor. And then growth, which makes sense because most of these, in fact, all of these uh, FANG stocks are, of course, high growth. Um, quite a few of these, like Netflix and Google, uh, those are in communications. Uh, we can see that they are positively related with liquidity, uh, positively related with size, negatively related with value, which of course makes sense if they are positively related with growth, um, positively related with momentum. I guess the currency factor shouldn't su surprise us because these are all uh, US stocks. And then overall the contribution gets substantially uh, less pronounced. So the main takeaway is, is that for now our portfolio has a big exposure to the US market overall. 
though that may actually be uh, interpreted to mean that the US market overall actually has a big exposure to uh, the FANG stocks rather than the other way around uh, but also exposure to growth um, exposure to liquidity uh, exposure to momentum negative exposure to value so that tells us how our portfolio currently stands in terms of what risk factors drive uh, its total risk and therefore its expected returns. So now let's see what risk factors uh, Tesla might be exposed to. So to do that we will need to launch a different program, Beta. Now, of course, beta can be used in the sense of a CAPM beta, which is to say any, uh, any stock's exposure to the market. But actually, you can compute a beta for any uh, other risk factor as well, not just the market. So to do this, first of all, let's say that we're going to look at Tesla. So we're going to type that ticker there. And for now, let's actually compute the market beta of Tesla. So we're going to use the S&P 500, the SPX, as uh, the risk factor representing market risk. Um, we can do this over a window. Two years is pretty decent. So this would be 2018 to 2020. You can go up to five years. Uh, let's actually say 2016. And here we see that our beta is close to 1. And if we were to change that back to, let's say, 2018, we see that our beta is substantially lower at 0.67. So the time window that you select to estimate either your portfolios or each individual stock's uh, factor exposures, the time window is actually going to matter a lot. Uh, so I, I think generally something between two to five years would be a reasonable window, but you have to make uh, sort of a educated guess as to whether recency or number of observations might actually make a bigger influence. So this is uh, the market beta of Tesla, the exposure to the market risk factor. You can see that it's actually, if we look at the past two years, uh, somewhat lower than our current portfolio's exposure of 1, which means that if we were to add Tesla to our portfolio, we should expect our market risk factor to go down. Our beta of the portfolio should decrease. Uh, what about, for example, growth? Remember, our portfolio was high on growth. Well, instead of looking at the market index, now you can actually put in a growth factor index. So Bloomberg maintains a set of indices. Here is the uh, growth index. So we're going to put that in. We'll keep the time frame the same, two-year window. And now we're going to calculate the beta on growth, which is to say Tesla's exposure to the growth risk factor. And we see that that is 3.5. Uh, it's actually quite huge and in fact substantially larger than our current portfolio uh, which means that if we were to add Tesla to our existing portfolio of the FANG stocks uh, we should expect our exposure to the growth factor to rise dramatically. Now we can do the same thing for momentum. Here is the momentum portfolio Generally, the way that you find these indices is you just type the name of the risk factor, so things like uh, growth value momentum, and then portfolio, and that'll pick up uh, the name of the Bloomberg risk factor that corresponds to it. So if we look at the momentum beta, we actually see that Tesla has a negative relationship with momentum over the prior two-year window. Uh, now let's see what happens if we change this to the last one year. This is a bit short. 
uh, we see that this is actually even stronger uh, potentially because as the markets have been moving down uh, Tesla's actually been moving up but again better to keep it at about a two-year time horizon so we can see that if we add Tesla to our portfolio we should expect our exposure to the momentum risk factor to decrease uh, what about value well we're gonna load up the value risk factor and we're gonna estimate beta relative to that and we see that it's not a large coefficient um, but it does seem to be positive so adding Tesla should increase uh, our exposure to uh, to value however another thing to pay attention to is uh, how significant these factor exposures are so the nice thing about the beta suite is that it actually not only gives you the coefficient estimate but also tells you what the significance of that coefficient is because remember the way these coefficients are determined is using linear regressions so you can see that the t-test for the value risk factor on Tesla returns is 0.13 uh, the significance of that is uh, 0.82 which means that it's actually not statistically significant uh, so we can therefore think of Tesla's beta on value uh, as essentially zero and if we go and revisit the significance of let's say the momentum portfolio uh, we can actually see that that one is also not really statistically significant though it's getting close uh, remember we can think of statistical significance as being meaningful when we get to maybe about 10 percent ideally five percent uh, right now we're not quite there what about growth also not much really and what about the market Now here we could make the case that with a significance level of 8%, uh, Tesla does have a statistically significant beta that we had previously considered. And if we expand our time series out, while it does potentially introduce room for some additional uh, regime changes, maybe Tesla responded one way to risk factors before, uh, responds in a different way to risk factors now uh, that does give us more observations to work with and may potentially give us statistically significant factor exposures whereas the two-year factor window didn't so indeed we see that if we expand our time window to four years 2016 to 2020 um, we actually get a significance of uh, pretty much 0, 0.00 uh, at the one percent level highly statistically significant now if we go revisit our exposure to the growth factor with this longer uh, time horizon we also see that now it's sort of marginally significant at about the ten percent level if we look at momentum we see that the negative relationship between Tesla returns and the momentum risk factors returns is actually highly significant and negative if you expand the time window out and if you look at value uh, we see that there there is still no statistically significant relationship even if we look at a longer time window so looking at factor exposures is a bit of a science as well as a bit of an art 
uh, because you have to make these judgment calls about how long of a time series you want to use in computing these loadings um, and the trade-off will be that you get more observations and therefore a higher statistical power in finding a significant relationship potentially though at the cost uh, of including some regime changes where the stock that you're looking at behaves differently over an earlier time period than it does at the current one. But you can compute these factor uh, loadings, risk factor exposures, uh, for each individual stock you're considering, and that can further inform your allocation decision relative to what your current portfolio's uh, factor loadings are, uh, even if something like an optimization doesn't work out. So this is just another perspective uh, that you can use another tool to help gauge your portfolio allocation decisions. Thanks for watching.